Thanks so much for joining Book Club today. Don't forget to like and subscribe and get ready to hear from some doulas who know squat. But no, th and that leads into my next topic. The system is broken more than the people. Mm -hmm. It is. The system is broken more than the people because if we're teaching people to do it in a certain way and within certain policies and rules and they keep making yes. new rules because they're trying to reduce uh, <gasps> yeah. things, yep. we can't have breech births because we have higher mortality rates with breech birth. But you know what? Now you're having higher C-section rates and higher rep yep. rupture rates and yep. we're having other issues that lowering the survival rate that's what's insane is once you hit a 15 percent c-section rate and it just keeps going up those extra c-sections that the ones that are happening that weren't necessary or were paused they aren't lowering mortality rates for mothers or babies no, no. so we're not going in a direction that's even helpful at that point and that's according to the world health organization Yep. You know, uh -huh, that, uh -huh. Well, and the more C-sections you have, the you higher know, your risks of mortality are too. So, and the home birth average is like below three. Five. Yeah, I was gonna say it's and like I, three percent or something. Just depending I literally on that. sat with my client um, who ended up having her cesarean, the, the one that I was talking about earlier, and there literally was like four cesareans between the time I think I got there at around. 5 p.m. to um, when she finally, I think, went in was around 3 or 4 a.m. There was like four or five cesareans. Why? What? Mm -hmm. Like, make this make sense to me. Like, okay. you used to barely hear of a cesarean in that short of a time frame where you'd be like, oh, must be an emergency or, oh, my goodness. But it's like, they're just rolling in those people. Like, okay, we reached they're a back stopping back. point. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and they and they couldn't even get to her for her and his, her epidural at first because they were in a section. It's yeah. like, are you kidding me right now? And they like, yeah, the anesthesiologist, so, as soon as they wrap up this section, like it's just, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they don't even I see it every no day I go to work, it. Janice. Every day oh I'm in the hospital. Oh my god. You know, I because so I ridiculous. look at the census, I'm seeing the actual list of moms who were vaginal versus C-section, there are days where it's literally 50% of the rooms I go into to do photos had C-sections, literally 50% or even 60% oh at times. And you can tell the difference between the hospitals too and the socioeconomic levels. So I'm going to be totally honest, the lower socioeconomic levels have better C-section rates than the higher socioeconomic levels and what i mean by better c-section rates they, they have lower up. rates they don't give them c-sections because they're not going to get paid hmm. i could name the hospitals if you want and you'll be like really yeah, don't do that we cannot that has no. nothing to do with the book exactly i'm not <laughs> going to name those hospitals but we'll save that for another topic so those who want to come back we'll talk about that <laughs> after we record yeah, <laughs> we want to donate dirt on the local hospitals then. Hire a doula and then we'll tell. Them. You I'll go. tell you the dirt. <laughs> I got some dirt. Hire a one on one, and we may be able to fill you in. We may be able to <laughs> say, but we'll be very like, well, we've had some very negative experiences in this space, but I have personally <laughs> had very positive experiences. Exactly. In this space. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we we can we cannot we cannot digress um <laughs> but the system is definitely broken well and i thought yes. that was really interesting when it started talking about the history of you know how we got there when we were disenfranchising black midwives and doulas and yes. i read another book called lying in it covered this really well um and just talking about how once they realized they could make a lot of money Mm -hmm. off of and then thought well if these women can do this I can do it better and we even see that in Europe I mean it happened all over the place where they take these midwives and discredit them and what's really interesting and this wasn't covered here this is from lying in um, but if you look at the mortality rates of who's doing well poorer people 
who were still giving birth at home with their midwives had yeah. better survival rates than people who could afford the fancy OB. I believe it because we're showing more interventions with the OB care. I mean, the statistics are there. We see it on a daily basis. It's just crazy to me that I'm like, but how did that not? Because it's set the curve was so intense. Because they hide it. I not see. I was yeah. looking at all of the, all of the things that it takes to um, be a midwife, and there are so many um, obstacles, especially because those who like you like you mentioned like community mid midwives or community doulas who want to transition to that it they make it so difficult um not just cost wise and you know this also um I won't speak on that that's for you to speak on um but <laughs> you are familiar as well like who can afford to do things with unpaid time that is mm -hmm. already in a low income community or setting and helping people who can afford to take out that much in loans if they decide to like do the, you know, the, the nurse midwife route and um, go through that much schooling where, you know, it's an all day, everyday thing. Again, we're still taking out of the pockets to get to this level and then having to still come out of school and be able to charge what the white counterparts are charging and have people still in that community be able to afford the services. It is an insane amount of just ask, honestly, like just to be able to help, which where the granny midwives started was like, oh, hey, bring them over here. You know, they did the barter system. They did whatever, you know, they needed to do. But it was all about making sure that we kept the village or the community alive and well, safe. Whoever had that skill, they shared it. Now it's like, um, pay us, the government, the, the corporations, uh, you know, these thousands and thousands of dollars. And then, you know, pay the people with money or money. There you go. And then pass your service on the people who got the money <laughs> to afford for you to be able to pay back these loans or make it worth your time, which still we're not getting to the people who needed the help the most. It's just insane to me. And it's a lot, it's a lot to ask that if, if say that, you know, you, your community doula was going out to be like, I want to do better for the community and become a midwife. That journey is, is in, in the regards of doing that is just, it's just not, and let's not even get on the preceptors. Depending by state, I've seen many of stories in like doula groups where again, that majority of preceptors are Caucasian and they are not wanting to train. Or they are letting them precept, but they're so nasty and rude to them that it still is discouraging. But then you have the same facet in nursing school where you have Black nurses that are dropping out because of the disrespect level of them trying to do better. So it is not even, even, a, even about the whole money at all as she mentioned before like you can go into you know um the hospital and you can be well educated and you can have all the money like Beyonce and Serena and still get mistreated so mm -hmm. you know it's like why am I going to do again as a student free birds you talk to me nasty or treat me rudely I have to endure this for a set amount of months or years before I can get to my NARM exam or do my nursing exam um, and then get into a um, whole situation where I then I have to probably, if I want, say my grants written off or my loans, rather not grants, loans written off, they're going to sit me in a position where now I have to be under someone who is also probably going to treat me in a very similar fashion because the system is the system. We're back to the system. Um, then leave there and now I can help my community 10 years later. Like, and then you still even then can't because we're looking at insurance not covering you. Oh, so you can mm -hmm. only do cash pay because as soon as insurance gets involved, then your quality of care tanks. They yes. have all of these arbitrary rules that are run by people who are not medical professionals, wow. right? Wow. They're not of the community that you're serving. So there's that problem. And then even if you do accept insurance or Medicaid, then your reimbursement levels are not a livable wage. Dropped. Yeah. Still not the standard and a livable wage. 
Yeah. It's just all when, you know, hands got involved in the whole ideal of midwifery, there hence it was more for the privileged than the lesser privileged. Which is crazy because this, what, what kind of flip-flop do we have here, right? We're going to disenfranchise them. We're going to say we can do it better. We're going to not reimburse for it. But it's so coveted that people will save up and that's yep. what they do. And it's for the privilege. What kind of logic Zigzag I know. are we applying Isn't it? here? It's insane. You know, and, and they I have incredible marketing skills. They have yes. fantastic marketing skills and they hide the actual statistics. They hide the truth and yep. they make sure that you feel like you're crazy for thinking mm -hmm. that this was a bad experience. What? Yeah. Are you sure this happened? Uh, yeah. Is that real? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly oh, how they look no. like. Are you? We yeah. had a, we had a client submit yeah. a complaint in the hospital asked us to communicate back and forth and we helped them fill out their complaint and send it to them. And then the, the head nurse who received the her, her response yeah. to, to me was to say our doula changed the client's opinion that she had a bad birth experience and she wouldn't have thought that if the doula wouldn't have gone over the birth with her after she had the baby yeah that's not our job we're like the stepchildren of the hospital um i <laughs> swear like <laughs> they're like if it wasn't for the stepkid my own kids would never have <laughs> Yeah, we are the redheaded stepchild. We had that adopted child come in this hospital. Now look what we have. They're just going around causing trouble. So that, like, they there always, no yeah. problem. And now there, okay. actually there was a problem, but she didn't feel she could talk to you about it. And she argued a lot of trust and cleared fear and was able to, to let you know what happened so you could do better next time. And you know what? When we clear fear with our clients and go through and re- and have them tell us their birth experiences, we don't always come out as shiny angels either. You know, I, and that's to me, that is some of the most valuable sit down sessions we can have when I have earned so much trust from my client that they can look me in the eye and say, and this is where you didn't do what I asked. Or this is where I felt like you were kind of pushing. Mama. And like, yeah. thank you for telling me that. You know, I really try not to do that, but you're right. I absolutely yeah. didn't live up to my own integrity standards in that moment. Um, and that can be, that's the biggest. And I would really like to see. And I, I think that's one of the things like the roots of midwifery. We are in our own community. You know, I'm going into their home to help them give birth. They yeah. feel an authority there. Um, you know, and I am not a midwife yet. I'm a student midwife. And I say that frequently to make sure nobody mistakes <laughs> And, I mean, but it, can but yeah. I mean, just think about like, can you even envision the popularity midwifery would have if women of color could get those services, insurance covered, or just even at a was affordable? You know that the hospitals would probably barely be full, and that is the problem because a lot of that population has no choice but to go to the hospital. They have no options. And, you know, when you have no options, what do you do? You take the lesser of the evils and you're just like, well, I'm just going to do it, bear it, and go through it because I there's no other options for me, which is where our fear clearing has to come in. And it has to be done with every Black woman who has to go into a hospital. It's just what it is. Like, if they don't know or haven't heard by now, they're going to hear from a family member, from a friend. Everyone is going to tell them like, they they kill him. You know what I mean? Like they killing us in there. Like I literally hear my clients say like, I'm scared I'm going to go in there and die. Like, I'm just, you know, I haven't even talked to them about it. I don't even rarely even discuss like, you know, the black bill of rights or things like that, uh, patient rights. Um, and it's just like, you know, I try to go in and be with the joy, but then I try to like give little tidbits of information of like, these are ways that I'll help you advocate if you're not being heard or disrespect in the space. Um, 
<laughs> but then but also doing your job they pop back with like yeah i think they're gonna kill me like and now we're on another level now i know like i came here and we're actually here so now i need to bring you down so we can meet halfway because i can't really debunk your fear i really can't honestly do that for you because it's it's a valid fear because it's happening and it's in the media and it's everywhere and you can't escape it and so it would be very like oblivious to me and very like almost disrespectful for me to act like it's not a thing like just be like you'll be fine I wouldn't even work no I would be lying to my clients mm -hmm. and so I have to go over like oh there's elevated blood pressure levels let's talk about it let's work on it now because your OB isn't and now we're setting you up and I think she mentioned that too in here about like let, let's counter that before we get to preeclampsia now we're at the c-section now we're at the induction all those things because we told you to take a baby aspirin every day and that's what they tell them and they leave it there that's it right there's no <laughs> they plan. tell them to take that baby aspirin the blood yep. thinner <laughs> and the and then they wonder why they have fine. low blood pressure yeah yeah they're like you'll be fine going in there and I have to tell my clients like no let's talk about magnesium let's talk about some other things oh your are and they want you to jump on the iron pill and be happy no let's talk about what you're eating let's talk about her like we have to talk about other things so that they're not dependent and when that stuff doesn't work which 80% of the time it tend it tends to not work alone <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean it may well, work they, and they don't it tell them doesn't work alone they don't, they don't tell them the risks. They don't tell them what potential outcomes they could have by no, taking a baby aspirin every day <laughs> and yes. how that can affect their birth no. process and no. the other interventions that they might have to have because they took no. a baby aspirin every day. Exactly. No. And How's so that as we get closer, baby? sometimes that baby aspirin was not never the issue. It was the fact that they already had, were hypertensive. Right. Before. Right. Like, you know, like they don't even. What were the other options to lower that blood pressure? Yes. They, they pay attention as the same person who came in hypertensive as a person who may just very well have like higher levels of their blood pressure due to pregnancy. Yeah. They get the same treatments. That shouldn't be the case. Well, they're not taking their baseline into account and no. they're not taking into account that provider anxiety is real. People have very blood real. pressure spikes, even yes. just thinking about going to see a provider mm -hmm. or stepping into a hospital, you know, ask yep. them, is this a normal blood pressure level for you? If you went and, and went outside of Walgreens and did their little blood pressure cuff every day at the same time, every day, exactly. what is that level? Let's find that out before we sit and say, oh, you're exactly. hypertensive. Yep. Yep. Or you have elevated levels, so let's just go ahead and get on the baby aspirin. Like, what, yeah. what, are, what are we, what, what are we doing? Like, can we talk about a nutritionist? Can we see, like, maybe you know, it's something that's you're, you're eating that's triggering this before we just like your problem, your body again. This is going yes. back to the failure of your body. Right. This is where we are. Are we walking? Your body every is day? already acting up. Are we getting up off the couch, okay. or are we sitting all day exactly. long? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what do we do for a living? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. when we walk, of course, we're going to have higher blood pressure because we sit all day and our body has to work harder when we're walking. And now it's got to move that blood in different ways than it did mm -hmm. when you're sitting. That is going to elevate your heart rate and your blood but pressure. But you can't fit all that into 15 and 20 minutes with your OB. No, <laughs> you can't do all that. It's, yeah, they don't, they don't care possible. to do all that. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, one of my clients was a family practice client. Um, she, she was a doctor in family, family medicine. And she was saying how the company she worked for, she was on the low end of how many clients she saw a day. Girl, she saw 15 clients a day and she's on the low end. She said the majority of family practice doctors see 30 clients a day. And I'm going, it's no wonder they only get five minutes with the, with the, a patient, you know, you're seeing 30, 36 people a day that, and then you have to go and chart on all of them and all the visits. You don't have time to spend 30 minutes with everyone. And it's a you, wonder why the system is backed up like it is too. 
Because right. when you have that one or two clients that's like, no, 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 I'm going to take my time. That's allotted to me. And I'm going to ask you the questions. They have to mm -hmm. answer them. They can't shoo them out the door. So then they're behind in their schedule. So then when you or I come in, they're like, oh, Dr. X, Y, and Z is behind schedule because someone mm -hmm. advocated and took the time that they needed to ask the questions. And now he's behind because he had people back, yeah. back to back for every 10 to 15 minutes and thought, you know, oh, this person is not going to let me do it. So I can't tell them to shut their mouth and get on out of here. I have to actually answer the questions. Yeah. yeah you got to do your job. But the other aspect of that is in our way of life, in our society and our economy, yeah. They can't give us 30 minutes because now we're talking a hundred dollars just for that one visit or more, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, if yeah. they're a $200 hour per, per hour doctor, <laughs> you know, I had a person tell me the other day, they were like, I know I didn't even spend near an hour in my doctor's office and they charged me almost 400 and something dollars for that. Right. Just that little regular visit. And I was like, wow. Cause she was like interested in like what a doula makes for a birth. And I was yeah. I won't mention the companies, but I was like <laughs> certain ones, you know, charge like under five. And she was like, oh, my God, my doctor for one appointment charges that. And that's like a set time. And I'm like, oh, no, it could be days, <laughs> um, hours. That's the flat rate. That's no more, no less. Flat rate. Just get right there. And she was yeah. amazed. Like, I'm like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Fun. We have to eat. I got to pay my bills too. So, you know, you average out how many births can I do a month? And what are my expenses? Most of us aren't making anything on top of that. <laughs> you know, it's exactly. just. So then, but we're yeah. also yeah. small, privately owned, individually yep, sure. owned businesses. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry. It was big old. That's like the biggest expense. <laughs> but, so yeah. Well, that so takes about, us to our chapter four, which we can pick up at our next. We'll session. Do that next week because we're already forty minutes over of a one hour. Oh, twice as long. But <laughs> looking at the system being broken, it you know. It's very interesting to me since I've been doing so much home birth now, obviously. So many of the things in the system that we're talking about right now that both of you were expressing such discontent with, I'm not seeing in the home birth world. You know, we're taking 45 minutes per client to sit and talk with them unless they don't want it. Some of them come in and they tell you what's going on and they're like, are we good? I'm busy. I got to go. And they take off and it's only been 20 minutes. And we're like, Okay. You know, yep. wait, come back. We need to be friends. That's part of this. I um, loved my home birth experience with my wow. midwives where we get to sit for an hour and chat. But I mean, it's also well, a niche, you know. Well, I mean, like it's not it's not going it's not going to treat the masses. You yeah. know what I mean? Like right. hospitals yeah. gotta yeah. treat the masses. It's gotta be in and out, in and out. Yeah. So I just don't even know when I'm looking at this and I'm saying, if you're a person who needs to give birth in the system and you know that you're only going to have five minutes with this doctor, you know, then at least having someone like we were talking about earlier that has the same values as you, that tends to support people that are giving birth in the way that you want. And that doesn't have to be unmedicated blah 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 stuff that we tend to say we think that this is a good idea you know maybe you know if you are like I tell people if you're planning on having a plan c section because you don't want to try a VBAC go to the hospital that does the most like go where that's the mill you know that those are your yeah, people this is true go there they will do yeah. a much better job than the people that never do them um that's true absolutely right and so like matching that, then maybe if you only see them for five minutes, at least what your is on your plan is routine for them. Yeah. Find the person that matches the story you want to have. Yep. Yeah. That's true. Regularly. And that they, you know, they've got the stats to back it up. And the questions that she was putting in there of like, tell me stories of people who have given birth. 
mm-hmm. like I'm saying I want to and you say that you support. Um, my favorite is to just ask, what should I expect when I come to give birth here before you've told them what you want? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it at all. You just say, what can I expect? And then listen to their answer. And if they start asking you questions for input, say, I just want to know generally. How does yeah. How do yeah. most of your clients tend to give birth? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good way to find out because if, yeah, if you're not clear on their expectations and they are not clear on yours, it's a spit show. That ain't gonna work.